Okay, let's get started. Um, this is me. I'm a retired professor from University of Washington. That's what emeritus means. It means you're, you have some value, but you know, you're know you not there anymore. Uh, and so I, uh, I was a physical chemist, and then I became an astronomer, and then I fell into hold the ozone layer and I landed in the ocean. So that's dangerous to do at the university. You don't have a specialty. You're sort of a chemist, astronomer, atmospheric scientist, oceanographer. What are you? So, but this is the way I learned about physical and natural sciences by doing each of them. So I want to uh, briefly today give you a summary of the climate science. And I'm going to stop after about half an hour, I hope. And then we'll have a chance for discussion about, OK, you get the science. What should I do? So first is the, is the science. Let's not debate the so-called scientific consensus. It's a reality. The science is real. We know it's happening. We know we're doing it. We know it's bad. But there's hope if we act. OK, here we go. Oops. That's right. Yeah, all right. Up or down, I'm getting it. Uh, th this is the sources of the material that I'm talking about. Um, they're at international level. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which represents climate science from around the world, uh, puts out a report every five or seven years or so. I helped write the first one in 1990. 1990, 95, uh, 2001, 2007, 2013. So about every four or five years. And they put out a special report saying, well, what if the world just warms up one and a half degrees centigrade, double that for Fahrenheit, or two degrees? What's the difference? What's, what's, does it matter? And then at, at a national level, we have a national climate assessment mandated by Congress every four years report on the climate science, drawing upon a science for North America and for the United States, especially the climate science special report at that time. And then here in the Pacific Northwest, one of the most important groups is the Climate Impacts Group, SIG, at the University of Washington. And so I'm going to referring to some of the science presented by, by these groups. Just to remind you, we may break the record again this year, but last year was the warmest year in at least 120,000 years. We have to use paleo data. There were no good thermometers back then, but using paleo data. But this may be the coolest year in the rest of your life, even though it's the warmest year since long before we walked out of Africa about 70, 80,000 years ago. So, and, and the CO2 in the atmosphere today is, goes back before the genus Homo existed, Homo, before Homo sapiens, OK? More than 3 million years ago. So we make huge changes already in the system. And we're not done yet. So this is a summary for policymakers. Often, you don't want to read the whole report. Look for the summary for policymakers. Just type in IPCC, you'll get it, summary for policymakers. So if we don't do anything, if we just continue, continue the emissions, we might reach 1.5 as soon as 2030. Some people, this year, we, we hit 1.5 degrees above the natural level, pre-industrial temperature, uh, uh, for some months. And if we do this month after month and year after year, and then, and then IPCC will say, yeah, OK, we're in the era of beyond 1.5. I personally think that we're, this in the rearview mirror. I think we're already past that. I think we're aiming at two or three or four, depending upon what we do. So these are different scenarios for low emissions to high emission and where we might go in the lifetime of children born today by 2100. Well, if we're really lucky, we might stop at one and a half and then come back down. And if we do nothing, we're going to end up at three or four degrees of warming centigrade, double that for Fahrenheit. That's where we're going. <clears throat> so we have a fair chance to overshoot uh, this uh, 1.5 uh, degrees centigrade uh, in this decade, maybe in the next year or two. You know, in, in the Paris Accord, it was put in, uh, try to keep the warming under 2 degrees with an aspirational goal of 1.5. That was put in especially by island nations in the Pacific. They knew that would be a harder goal than 2, but I think actually we're, we're already almost past that now. This is the global carbon dioxide measurement record at Mauna Loa, Hawaii. Uh, there's two records. One is started by Dave Keeling, maintained by his son, Ralph Keeling, the Scripps record. And side by side with that is the NOAA US government record. So these two instruments are, are still running side by side. In addition, the NOAA network has a station uh, every minute making, making CO2 measurements in Barrow, Alaska, American Samoa, and the South Pole. So we have these four continuous stations and, and side by side with Scripps in Hawaii. I ran, I ran this network back in 1983 or so. And back then, the value was 342. The value today, 420, 425. So we're, we're, uh, we're well on the way to, <coughs> to double CO2. This is the actual temperature record. 
given by several different international and national groups and with very good agreement. And you can see that uh, we've already warmed the Earth at least 1.2, maybe, maybe more than that already, above the pre-industrial natural level. Again, here's the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their report from two years ago, looking at impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. That's sort of, this is what could happen. This is how we might adapt to it. And this is to what, we're, to what extent we're vulnerable. It doesn't say what you're supposed to do about it. That's, that's, a, that's another chapter. But this is the chapter that looks at impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. As Professor Dessler at Texas A&M said, adaptation is the Band-Aid. It's not the solution. Adaptation is, you know, all this stuff has already happened. What are we going to do to protect ourselves against rising sea level? Not how do we stop the sea level from coming up. That's a different. That's mitigation. So, uh, again, the emissions are still going up. This is an older slide, but we're somewhere here. And uh, we're, we're burning through about 40 billion tons of uh, carbon uh, a year as a global society. How many people in the world? About 10 billion? That's 4 billion. That's four tons per person on the planet. What's the US average? About 15 or 20. So we're, we're way above the global average. We need to go down. Even as people in the developing world say, don't talk to us, you know, we, we, don't, we don't drive cars yet. Don't tell us what to do. Well, we have to cut down. Everybody has to reduce, but especially developed countries where our emissions are four or five times the global average. And again, if we don't, we're going to end up here. This is uh, large regions of the world would not just be un un unpleasant, they'd be uninhabitable. You can't live there. What do you do? You move. You go. If you've got money, you, you go somewhere across borders to cities and then to other countries if you can. That's, that's just mass migration. This is where we want to be. And these emissions go negative later in the century. That means you're taking more out than you're putting in. Here's what we have to do in, in, in raw numbers. We're, we're at 40 billion tons for 10 billion people, four tons per person per year. We're going to cut that in half by 2030. Can we do it? And then cut that in half in the next by 2040. And cut that in half by 2050. A half of half of a half. Then we're down to almost 10 percent of what, but that, that's not enough. Then you still have to still have to pull out, uh, reduce the land use emissions, that deforestation, et cetera, uh, to get that down. And then you have to also begin have direct uh, mechanical removal of CO2. That's expensive right now. Uh, uh, reforestation helps, stopping deforestation helps, but and planting trees is not enough. We're going to have to actually mechanically remove CO2 and bury it in rocks underground. I only uh, showed some uh, marine impacts, as this is uh, about whales. So this is about where we are in the temperature. Here, here's five degrees, four, three, two, one. So we're, we're somewhere here already. And as you go from yellow into red or purple, uh, have more risk. So the first, the highest risk right now is to warm water corals. Here's coral bleaching. So that's already happening. We've already lost about half the corals in the world. I don't like to tell my grandchildren they can't snorkel on the reef and see the fish. I like to go to Hawaii and do that. Maybe they'll say, oh, yeah, I remember when I was a little kid, we used to, we used to see the fish. So coral reefs at risk, kelp forests, sea meadows, epipelagic and rocky shores. These are some of the, the risks to, to ocean ecosystems as a function of temperature increase. And then as the world warms, warmer water evaporates more. There's more evaporation. But where does it rain? Where does it come down? It comes down in high latitude, maybe more as rain than as snow. And some parts, especially in the subtropicals, in the Mediterranean region, in Brazil, southern Africa, Australia, drying conditions, drier. Maybe more rainfall in the equatorial region, maybe rainfall in sub-Saharan Africa, maybe rainfall in the Persian Gulf, but in general, uh, there is more evaporation, there's more rainfall, uh, and that energy of evaporated water is the energy which drives storms. So stronger storms, more violent storms, because of more moisture in the air carrying the energy from the evaporation. <clears throat> this is the simple summary. This, uh, where uh, waters are becoming lower in oxygen, is it blue, and, and red dots is coastal uh, hypoxic zones, so, zones of lower in oxygen. So the, the global ocean is losing oxygen. Not a lot. Every second breath you take is from phytoplankton making oxygen. The first breath you take is from forest. So phytoplankton, green plant photosynthesis on the land gives about half the oxygen, and the other half is coming from phytoplankton in the ocean. But the oceans are getting hot, 
because of warming, sour because they're absorbing CO2, breathless because they're losing oxygen, toxic because of toxic algal blooms, and higher sea level. All these are the changes in the global ocean, and it's re reflected everywhere as well, including here in the Northwest. When I uh, graduated from college in 1965, this was a distribution, nice bell-shaped curve, of colder, normal, and warmer temperatures for the northern hemisphere. And uh, 30 years later, look how this has shifted. Here's the old curve. Here's the new curve. We, we've gone to fewer cold times, fewer normal times, more hot times, and some extremely hot times. So the global temperature on the land. So in general, it's true that uh, the warming is greater on the land than over the ocean. The warm is greater at high latitude than low latitude. The warming is greater at night than during the day. These are all predicted and all observed aspects of warming. So if you look out mid 21st century, late 21st century, look for a high emission scenario, look at this. And okay, you'll find Seattle somewhere here. So uh, four or six degrees Fahrenheit, uh, three, three degrees or more centigrade warming. Uh, if we stay on this high emission scenario, we really, we really rather have uh, a low emission scenario uh, and not see that kind of warming. So for the U.S., transportation is the largest source of emission. More than electricity generation, coal-fired power plants, more than industry, more than agriculture, more than residential, it's transportation. In, in, in the globe, that's not true. In the globe, it's probably in electrical generation and agriculture are larger. But this is the number for the U.S., about a quarter of it, almost a third. We're going, to, we're going to come to the U.S. to the uh, Washington State numbers in a minute. So we're already experiencing drought in the Western United States. This is from last year, in the Midwest and especially in, in the Southwest, drought conditions affecting agriculture. And this is true globally, but this is just a map for the U.S. Chronic, long-duration hydrological drought, increasingly possible. How about here in the Northwest? What, what do we think is going to happen here? <clears throat> it's going to get warmer, as it will everywhere else. We're going to have more extreme weather. We're going to have reduced snowpack. Maybe more, maybe less total precipitation, but more evaporation. And so less snowpack, which means uh, more runoff in the winter and less water in the summer, and rising sea level, which has already happened. We've already had about mm, 9 inches, 12 inches of sea level rise here. Now, it doesn't matter tectonically if, if land is subsiding or uplifting. That matters, too, but not as much. The, the, uh, the influence of the sea level at, at a few centimeter, a few inches per decade will overwhelm that. Now, whether we're going to have one, feet, uh, one foot of sea level rise in the lifetime of children born today or six feet of sea level rise, in California, they are planning for six feet of sea level rise. So the Coastal Planning Commission says, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We should be looking at California for where, where we should allow people to build. Because the, what is currently the high tide level, the mean high tide level, will become the mean low tide level, six or eight feet. It's possible. There's some chance of that happening in the lifetime of children born today. So here's a number for our, our state. Look, wow, transportation. So you want to say, what, what should I do to uh, reduce my impact on climate change? <clears throat> Buy an electric car, walk, take public transportation, support measures at the county and state level that, uh, that, that move us in that direction. Because transportation is number one, number two, and number three. Yes, electricity generation, not so high. Why? Because we have some hydropower generation. We need to increase that, <coughs> residential, commercial, and other, including agriculture. But this is the big number. This is the big kahuna. Is, yes? Does it include air travel? Yes. Okay. And for many people, we have an electric car at home. I have solar panels. Uh, our house burns no fossil fuel. But we fly to see grandchildren. We like to take trips, go to Hawaii, or whatever. So we're going to talk about that in the, in, at the end. What can I do? Well, um, you can travel. You can burn less fossil fuel by traveling less. But I want to see the grandchildren, right? Uh, <clears throat> so what do you do? I mean, maybe you can buy carbon offsets. If the money that you put into that offset actually goes to something that reduces emission of CO2 to the atmosphere or makes your, makes your community or island, county, uh, more robust to the changes that are coming. We'll talk about that in the end. So locally, the Climate Impacts Group at the university issues reports. This one's a little bit old now. Uh, 2013, about 10 years old, climate change in the Puget Sound region. So you can study that. And, and again, these figures are here uh, on the website. So you can, I, I, I'm having to, the students tell me I talk too fast, and I do. So all these figures are here. You can see them later. 
You can, you can view these at your leisure. So what's going to happen here, what Sig says? Well, more hot days if we have 1.5, and I think we're almost there already. Less snowpack, higher winter stream flows, lower summer stream flows, and rising sea level. Maybe they say a foot and a half by, by the time we have this warming. I think this is low. I think these reports are uh, on, on the conservative side. I think it's going to be worse than that. This was back in the sum, uh, uh, June of 2021. Do you remember? Yes. yes. People died. Yeah. Hundreds of people died. Maybe 1,000 people. If you look, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, more than 1,000 people were killed by that heat wave. And so these are some of the impacts uh, for the Pacific Northwest in terms of glaciers, snowpack, wildfires, rising sea levels. I'm not going to take the time to read all that. Oops. 2015 was a pretty bad year, too. We lost half the sockeye in the Columbia River. Too warm. Too dry to plant winter wheat. And then, because this is a, a marine setting, we have sunflower sea stars dying. We have invasive crabs. And uh, our Puget Sound region is changing as well. What about sea level rise? Well. Maybe a billion people live within 30 feet of the high tide line, including 250 million people within three feet of the high tide line. So one projection is that as many as 10 or 12 million Americans could see their homes underwater if we had six feet of sea level rise. If you're, if you're in the planning department for Langley or for the island county, you have to be concerned about uh, what, the tide, what the high tide's going to be. And your septic system is right above the high tide line. It's going to be underwater. And pollution is one of the problems that, that the orcas are facing, right? Not enough salmon, polluted water, noise from ship traffic, all of that. So whether we get two or four or six feet by 2100, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's, maybe that's further out, but it's in the pipeline. It's in the pipeline. Maybe the children of the children born now, the, ch the toddlers today, their children may see six feet of sea level rise. So if you have, grandma had, a, had a, a cabin on the high tide line, that's not going to be there for the grandchildren. Many people came to Whidbey Island because they came up here for, for vacations and had family up here and then moved here. It's a wonderful place. You love it. You don't want to see that kind of change. <clears throat> but sea level is already impacting people throughout the world. I don't have time to really go into this, but it's sort of the size of this circle says what the impact of sea level rise will be. Yes, North Carolina, <clears throat> Louisiana, Florida, worse. We're about like California. We're worse than Oregon, OK, because we have low, a lot of low-lying tidelands. And so uh, we will have hundreds of thousands of people impacted by sea level rise if we have four or six feet of sea level rise. So this is one report from SIG written by Ian Miller and others. And I think it's too conservative. That's my view, is that uh, this was, again, some years ago, and I think that what we've learned about uh, loss of uh, Antarctic, uh, uh, Pine Island Glacier, and Greenland says that these numbers are probably too low. Here's a different view from Zillow Real Estate and the Union of Concerned Scientists saying that the sea level rise will actually be much higher than SIG estimates. So it's debated. But if we had six feet of sea level rise, you like to go and see the tulips? Bye-bye. No more tulips. That's it. No more coral reefs. No more tulips. What kind of world are we going to leave to our children and grandchildren? Oops. Sorry. Uh, so this is one study that looked at the economic impact of, of uh, climate change on the continental United States. <clears throat> Red is bad, and green is good. So these people in Florida and Texas, where are they going to go? They're coming north, right? They're coming north. If they've got money, they'll move. Some people who don't have the resources will lose their homes but have to stay in the region where they are now. But a lot of people will move north. What's happening in, in ecosystems, on the land and on the ocean, species are moving poleward. It's happening already. So where are the dis weather disasters? Hey, we look pretty good. We look pretty good. People are going to be coming here. <laughs> they already are. The, the, the estimated population trends for uh, Island County I think they're planning for like 20% or something like that. We're about 80, 80 some, 80,000. And they're talking about another 20 or 25,000. But it could be more than that. How do you keep them out? Going to build a wall? So, 
as Abraham Lincoln said, let the people know the facts. I mean, the science. And the country will be safe. So here's, here's me up here, blah, 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 energy independence, green jobs, livable, renewable, blah, blah, blah. And the guy stands up and says, hey, oh, it's a big hoax, and what if we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> well, let's create that better world, no matter what. Uh, I, I leave with, I stop with this uh, quote, uh, the poem by Drew Derringer. Drew Derringer. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great, great grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great, great grandchildren asked me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the seasons were failing and they asked the mammals and reptiles and birds were fall, all dying. Did you fill the streets with protests when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? So this was the poster for uh, AIDS, HIV in South Africa who died. He, he was born with... Uh, HIV, and he died at 12. Do all you can with what you have in the time you have where you are. And as Catherine Hale says, the most important thing you can do is talk about it. Talk about it. So I'll stop there, and we'll uh, have questions about what we can do, it's starting with carbon offsets, because I know that uh, Susan had asked me about that. Questions? Sorry. Did that go too long? It was about half an hour. All right. <laughs> So here's what we should, I think we should do. Mitigation, make it less bad. Put less CO2 up, take some CO2 out, whether that's through forest or direct mechanical, and adapt to the changes that, that are coming no matter what. Adapt to the changes that we've already made that we can no longer avoid, and try to avoid the changes to which adaptation is really difficult. So we need to do both of those. So be more efficient in the use of water and energy, reduce waste, recycle, compost, all of that, I'm sure, Many of you are doing that now. Electrify your home and transportation energy use. Stop burning fossil fuel. Consider, consider an EV for your next car. Maybe a used EV if you can't buy a Tesla. I don't have a Tesla, but I have a Chevy Bolt. It works fine. <laughs> and I can get 250 miles on a charge, charging at home. That's enough to go around here, go to the airport, go to Seattle and back, off the rock, as they say. Um, really? uh, septic systems make them well above the mean high tide line now because Ocean's coming up, and that is largely unstoppable. Measure your carbon or personal family footprint, and then reduce it. And if you can't reduce it, pay for that damage. So now we're into, into this field of carbon offsets. So for those of you who are doing all these things already, but you still fly a lot, your carbon emissions from flying are probably your number one in source of CO2 to the atmosphere. And whether you think the carbon's social cost of carbon is $50 a ton or $100 a ton, you can work it out. And uh, you can offset, but you have to make sure that the money that you spend uh, does something useful. I'm not so much in favor of planting little trees because it's going to be a generation before they're big enough to take carbon out of the air. I am very much in favor of um, using the carbon offset money to build uh, renewable energy sources in the developing world, with solar and wind and sub-Saharan Africa. Those are really permanent. And if they do that, instead of having China help them build a coal-fired power plant, that's a good deal. So why don't I stop there and see if there are questions or comments on what I've said. Are you silent? <laughs> I really like the, where, where you were adding the importance of talking about it and keeping the conversation going within our communities because, uh, you know, we all work places. People you know, beyond in your own household, you know, we're, we're doing as, as much as we can within our own households, but also, you know, you go to the grocery store, you go to restaurants, you go to work, you go to schools, everything like this. And there is a lot of low hanging fruit, I would say, in terms of changes that are not that big of a deal that really cost nothing to do in in sometimes you save money and saying hey why are we taking why are we taking five cars to get to this place how about we don't do that you know it, like bringing it bringing it up within your within your community workplace wherever it may be because especially in workplaces it, you know one large company switching from 
I don't know, whatever it may be, reusable silverware to uh, making the switch to reusable rather than using single-use plastic that they're getting shipped over. There's the shipping cost. There's the manufacturing cost. There's all of this stuff that you're just, they, it's so much consumption that we can cut down and reduce in that way. And over, over years, it makes a, a huge difference. In one year, it makes a huge difference. For me and for our family, we found that uh, there was a, I, we, used to, we used to live in Shoreline, and there was an effort called Taming Bigfoot, Reducing Your Carbon Footprint. Bigfoot, your carbon footprint. And uh, I found, after looking at my personal and family carbon emissions, that one thing I could do that I was not doing is compost my garbage. <laughs> and so now I compost. I have more soil in my garden. And so uh, being aware of what your emissions are, whether it's from flying or whatever it is, and living in a more sustainable way. One of the issues on the island, of course, is water. Now, uh, up in Oak Harbor, they have, a, they have a pipe, right? Skagit River or something. But down here, we're all on groundwater. Nobody knows, even the Island County hydrologist does not know how much water we have, at what rate we are withdrawing it relative to the rate it's recharge. We don't know that. What we do know is that for the future, probably we're going to have lower recharge. Even if we have the same amount of total precipitation, if there's more evaporation, there's less water going into the ground. So using water more responsibly, more efficiently, that means taking out your yard, maybe, <laughs> I'm tired of cutting grass. I'm working on <laughs> <laughs> I think I have one more slide to show you. This one. What can I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, maybe I don't have a slide. Well, I just have to say it. Uh, one, one local source of, of carbon offsets, there's a new fund being created. There's something called the uh, Whidbey Climate Action. I'm a member of that. And through that, Tara Anderson is helping set up the Whidbey Climate Fund. The money going to the, uh, yeah, we'd be climate fund. And uh, when they have enough money, then they'll have proposals. And this money will be used to uh, make carbon offsets locally. Now, I'm personally, most of, my, most of my emissions are, uh, I'd like to have them work in the developing world where the where damage is worse. But Tara is really concerned that we need to have, collect money for carbon offsets here on the island and use this to make Island County more robust against climate change. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, just go on Whidbey Climate Fund on your computer and you can find it. Any questions, other comments, please? I yeah. Just, I want to um, just say that I've, I've known you for... 30 years? Many, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to age either one of us. <laughs> but we, we used to call him Dr. Doom <laughs> in Beach Watchers. Um, but back then, when the models were, you know, just um, uh, some of the climate models were, you know, people were really skeptical yeah. or more skeptical than sure. they are now. Um, and it bothers me that there are still people skeptical because even then, the reality was starting, you know, they were proving the model. Jim Hansen was out there ahead of the others. He said in summer of 1988 that we're in the greenhouse century. Right. And other scientists said, whoa, Jim, you're way out there. You're going yeah, too far. But within 10 years, the data was in. We knew right, it. We right. see the signal, we're causing it. Right. Yeah, and yeah. you were on the cutting edge of that. And, but I, you know, I applaud you for, for being such a good teacher and for giving us the facts. And it, it is really, I know it's, it's very, you know, it's upsetting, but you always end with, you know, you can do this and we can do this and there are answers to this. And by giving us ways to talk about it with others and, and things we can do about it. So you don't, you know, I mean, it was a, a, a joking thing that we called you Dr. Doom. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only one. But, yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm sure. But My wife it, is here. It, you, it is, it's, such an important, <laughs> it's such an important thing that you do. And you have to grieve for what we're losing. We're losing some really important parts of nature. And that's real. Our grief is real. But we have to be motivated by, to go ahead. Right, right. And it's, it's My just, problem is I don't see enough motivation. I get terrified from climate change, absolutely panic-stricken. Yeah. I'm seeing too many species that are just, and so granted, I don't, 
follow the news as closely as maybe some people because it just is too upsetting in certain regards. But I just don't see the panic. Maybe I'm, I feel like everyone should be panicked. The city of Langley has declared a climate emergency, right? right. Island County has not declared a climate emergency. I, Our state has not yet declared a climate emergency. Langley is so far out ahead. I'm so afraid it's going to be 2030. And what have we done? Well, we've twiddled our thumbs. And I just don't see enough. We're not doing enough. We need to do everything all at once right now. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Jill McIntyre went, yes. Yeah. But, yeah, just hold I on. applaud your heroism too. I, yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is hard work to get out there and say things that a lot of people, you know, are sort of indoctrinated to deny. Not you people. Really. You're here. You're here. <laughs> You're in a good yeah. crowd here. Um, I used to go with Dave Anderson to some talks when yes. he used to do yeah. this, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he met skepticism <laughs> sure. know, in different groups. And so I, I don't like to get political because the science is really the science. It's a description of physical reality. But they did say, one of the Republican candidates for president said, we're not school children, you know. Let's have the debate. No, let's not have the debate about the science. That's done. It's over. Right, right. Debate, let's no. debate about what we do about it, market right, versus right. government, all that. Right. Let's debate that. No, yes. well, I come from a long tradition of political activism, so Yay. I don't avoid the science and the, uh, <laughs> politics either. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some, you know, actors that are bad actors sure. in this world and that are really saturating the consciousness with the denial. Even in families, you're going to have an uncle, have a brother who's a petroleum engineer in Houston. Houston. We don't talk about this. Right. So it's hard to have the conversation sometimes. But we need to. Yeah. We need to. Yeah, yeah, we need to. And I would like to name names, but not here because. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we're really proud that Richard joined our board this year and is, you know, helping advise Orca Network on doing more yes, on, um, on Thank you. this issue and helping us on how to, how to do more. So, yeah. Yeah. It's really, that was great. Really great.